I was hearing more and more people with that negative attitude towards math. I'm hearing a lot of, I was never good at math, so I don't expect my kids to be good at math. Like a lot of really discouraging statements that I hate to hear. And so at one point, I wanted to find a book to recommend to some friends that they can read with their children to instill a bit more of a We are excited to bring you this math. episode with you Alice parents, Aspinall, so really author of the children's book, on. Everyone Can Learn Math. Alice is a high school math teacher here in the Windsor, Ontario area, which is in our neck of the woods. We chat with Alice about how her book is helping families change the way they talk about math at home. Stick around so you can learn about why it's important to use positive language when talking about math, why a growth mindset is key to learning mathematics, and how you can use her book in your classroom. Hit it! Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. We are two math teachers who, together, with you, the community of educators worldwide who want to build and deliver math lessons that spark engagement, fuel learning, and ignite teacher action. Are you ready to get going there, John? Of course, of course, Kyle. Before we begin, we want to give a quick shout out to Dub underscore two, who left us a five star rating and review on iTunes. Dub underscore two says, Jam packed with practical suggestions and real math teacher struggles. I just recently got into listening to podcasts and this is my absolute favorite. Kyle and John offer so much practical advice and also inspire me for my own classroom. Love the special guests and hearing the success stories. I'm hooked and I'm quickly going through all episodes while prepping for the coming school year. If you've been loving the podcast, just like J-Dub, leave us a review on iTunes and outline your biggest takeaway. Reviews help more educators hear about the show and in turn, we can help make more math moments matter for students everywhere. Before we begin our discussion with Alice, we want to share that the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast is excited to bring you another giveaway, this time with Whitebook, our source for Whitebook flip charts. That's right. You can easily post whiteboards anywhere in your room and easily take them with you wherever you go. Whitebook is offering you, the Math Moment Maker community, the chance to win one of five flip chart packs. Yes, one of five flip chart packs by visiting makemathmoments.com forward slash giveaway. Not interested in chancing it? You can also take advantage of a special 50% discount on flip chart packs by simply entering the giveaway. Enter that giveaway by visiting makemathmoments.com forward slash giveaway and you'll see how you can take advantage of this special 50% off offer. Don't delay. The giveaway and the 50% discount ends on Wednesday, August 28th, 2019. Head to makemathmoments.com forward slash giveaway to get your name in the hat. Listening after Wednesday, August 28th, 2019? Don't sweat it. We're always actively running giveaways. So check out that same link, makemathmoments.com forward slash giveaway, regardless of when you're listening to this episode to learn about what we will be raffling off this month. Remember, you got to play to win. Dive in at makemathmoments.com forward slash giveaway. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash giveaway. And now here's our chat with the author of Everyone Can Learn Math, Alice Aspinall. Hey there, Alice. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. We are so excited to have you on the show today. How are things all the way on the other side of Bell River, Ontario? <laughs> good morning. Thanks for having me on. Everything is good. It looks like an overcast day on my side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alice is quite local for us. She is coming from the same town as Kyle, which is also only 15, 20 minutes from my house. Alice, help our listeners understand a little bit more about yourself. Other than that, tell us a little bit about your background, a little bit about your teaching journey, your teaching story. Yes, I'll be happy to. I started very early in life with the idea that I wanted to be a teacher. So I knew pretty early on. I didn't know what kind of teacher, but I wanted to be a teacher that I knew for sure. And 
at the end of high school, I finally decided I wanted to be a math teacher. So I actually started my undergrad in the honors math program currently with education. So I did them both at the same time because I knew that that's where I was headed. And while I was in university studying my math degree, I started tutoring children in mostly in elementary school in math right away. So I did that for the full time I was doing my undergrad. And I did that in schools, like through an in-class tutoring program. And I did that also in private homes. So I had quite a bit of experience with the elementary math world at that time, but I did end up going into teaching at the high school level. And so I got hired pretty quickly out of school and started teaching right away. Now I've been teaching at the high school level for 11 years, mostly math, though I did teach English for a bit in there also, because I am qualified to teach English as well, but I've done mostly math now. So that's really where my passion lies in teaching math by day at the high school level. And then sort of on the side, I have this ongoing passion with the little ones, especially with my own two children now, too. Fantastic. Fantastic. I've got to ask, back when you were doing your undergrad and you were doing some tutoring in schools, did that happen to be through our current district? Some might not know this, but you and I both work at Greater Essex here in Windsor, Essex in Ontario. Was it through Greater Essex? Uh, Because I did something similar. Was it Ron Mutton who did that with you? Like, was he the leader at the time? Yes, he was. But then I continued after he retired. And then a woman took over the program. Michelle, now her name is escaping me, her last name. But yes, it was that program. Yeah. So when I started, started with Ron and then it switched over to someone else. Awesome. Super cool. Yeah. So you and I both kind of participated in that same program. At the time, I didn't think... I just looked at it as like, hey, it's a tutoring job and this is what I'm up to. And it was an elementary, like you were saying. And I think looking back on it, it gave me a lot of really great PD for myself just to kind of expose myself to where students were struggling. I don't think I was very effective at it at the time, to be honest, but I think I learned a lot. I'm not sure what your thoughts were after that experience. Yeah. You know what's funny about that experience? I think back to that a lot now, and I didn't know at the time, but what I was doing, and I did a lot. I I worked so many days a week while I was also studying, obviously. That was a bit revolutionary because we took kids out in small groups, and I worked on them one-on-one, but we never did worksheets or repetitive work. I was creating games to have them have fun with math. They were all often students who were struggling a little bit more or didn't have a lot of positive attitudes towards math. Those were the kids that I was often working with. But we were using games and some fun strategies to try to get those kids more interested and develop some good habits. And that, when I think back to it now, because that was quite a while ago, was kind of a big deal, right? Like I think at that time they would have been doing a lot of worksheets in the classroom, but when I pulled them out, that's not ever what we did. And so I hope that it was effective and worthwhile for those kids that I worked with so often. I think it was a good learning experience for me now. I use some of those same games with my own kids now, and they were just games we made up with counters or playing cards or I don't know, lots of different manipulatives. You know, I agree. Again, I didn't really understand the intentionality. And I think I was just so new and just fresh because I was in my undergrad. I hadn't even gone to teacher's college yet. So you had done concurrent, whereas I had done mine at the end of my degree. So I was doing this during my degree. So I had no teaching experience whatsoever, just like my own personal tutoring experience. And You know, when I look back on those types of experiences, oftentimes it's not the learning that happens in the moment. It's the learning after you reflect in it. Sometimes it's days later, weeks later, but oftentimes it's like years later when you start to sort of have epiphanies and things like that. And, you know, that was one of the epiphanies I had as well was this idea that, you know, I was working with students and we weren't doing things the way I was taught. So I thought that was really cool to see. Now, I think that program sort of becomes something they call Curiosity Club in our district. And it's an after school program. And they're doing really, really cool things. Same type of approach where they want it to be a fun, enjoyable way for students to learn and to just kind of brush up on some of their math skills, but doing it in a fun and non-threatening sort of way. 
I also can relate to, and I find this very interesting. It makes me wonder about how many of us, how many teachers, when before they became teachers or when their first experiences was with tutoring, that was my first co-op job also. Like I was in the co-op program, which meant to every couple of semesters you're going out to work. And my first few were all tutoring jobs and I was working at Humber College tutoring college level students. But I wonder, I wonder about that. Like how many of us are tutoring to start. I'm sure it's a lot of us. And and again, that same kind of thing. It's like, we're all kind of trying different things way back in that time. It's kind of like, I remember having that thought. It's like, I wanted to change the way what math was taught. And I was hooked on the idea of like hooking students from the get go, which is a shame later, because I think it dropped off after my first few years. It was like, I was really concerned about getting my students to love math the first few years. And that kind of fell by the wayside when I had some experience. And then it's only in the last, what, say five years where I've tried to make things different. But, you know, I was concerned about card tricks and games and magic tricks with numbers were huge for me when I first started. It was like, I got to start class with one of these every day to kind of win the kids over. I thought that was a big thing when I first became a teacher. Let's keep kind of going down memory lane here, Alice. Being our, you know, the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast, we have to ask you about your memorable math moment. So we want you to kind of think back to your experience as a student in math class. And when we say math class, what pops into your brain? Oh my goodness. My experiences in math class as a child are not very fun or positive at all. I don't have a key moment where I thought I was having a lot of fun in class. It was very rigorous, repetitive work. I remember a lot of mad minutes. And funny enough, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it only because I was a good student. I wanted to please. I did what I was told. I was afraid to get in trouble. And so I really enjoyed just sitting down with a good worksheet, you know. But when I think back, there was nothing very enjoyable about any of that. I have one particular memory that always stands out to me. I was in grade three and my class was in a portable outside. And I remember sitting at the table and we were doing two digit addition. And I remember a worksheet and we had to do all of these in a row and I was doing them and I always did the algorithm starting on the ones column and then re, you know, regrouping over. And I remember not passing my one over to the next column and getting it wrong. And then the student next to me was trying to tell me that I was wrong and she was able to do it in her head. And I couldn't figure out how she was adding these things in her head properly because I couldn't do any of those mental math strategies. It was just about doing the algorithm on paper, how I was taught. And so if I made a mistake somewhere, I didn't know why or how to fix that mistake, right? I couldn't go back. And I just remember being in awe of this student and how she was doing it all in her head properly. So that really speaks to the lack of emphasis on that mental math, which I I hope now And I think now is being emphasized a lot more. And I'm trying to really bring that out in my own children because that mental math is so important when you're learning higher level math later on. Yeah, so that I didn't have a lot of great, exciting math experiences. Very traditional. Yeah, I totally get you with the mental math. And I've shared this before because I didn't have any mental math strategies when I was younger. And I think as a math teacher, developing mental math strategies so that you can do it quickly in the classroom has been a lifeline for me. But the interesting thing that I've also mentioned here is that those mental math strategies are not the way I've shown kids how to do calculations on paper. You know, like there are different ways that I'm doing them in my head that I also, like you, share with my own kids so that they can benefit from that. I also found it interesting that when you said you liked that worksheet, and I also agree with you because I think a lot of us liked that. Like you said, we were good listeners. We didn't want to get in trouble. We were people pleasers. We excelled in math class. And I think it's kind of like we felt, and I was just trying to articulate that what it was about really enjoying those worksheets because you've got kids in our classrooms that also will say, I really like doing that and I'd rather do more of that. And like you said, I think it's like, what really is the enjoyment there? Like, is it really the worksheet that they're enjoying? And I think it's come to me that it's like the enjoyment comes because they feel safe, you know, they feel it's easy or they can go like, I can work on this and I can be in my little bubble and I know that I will get it done because I've done this in the past. But it's like that safe kind of comfort feeling that, hey, I've been successful here already. 
and I don't mind doing this thing because it will be done by the time class ends. You know, and we've experienced this before, and I know you've experienced this before when you bring kids out of that safe environment and you ask them to think out loud or reason or defend arguments. It's all of a sudden a little unsafe. And some of our strong kids who are used to that worksheet are kind of uneasy. And all of a sudden it's a different kind of classroom. Yeah, so I'm sure that you notice that the kids who really enjoyed the worksheet and the traditional learning model are the students who have figured out how to do school well. Like they have figured out school and how to comply. And so that is a comfort level for them because that's what they're used to. And they have always succeeded in just learning that way. And they don't really want to try anything new and different. And I think that that's part of the growth mindset too, which maybe we'll talk about later, but they just are very happy doing well the way they've always done well. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I picture myself as that same student. Like I know that if my teachers ever tried to switch gears on me, I would have made the biggest fuss about it because now it's like, now I got to relearn all this and not relearn the content because I never understood the content. I just did the content, but like relearn how to be at least considered successful, at least from a grade standpoint. My grade said I was doing well. And that's something that I think is really, really important. And I sort of want to make sure that people who are listening understand you had mentioned things like tutoring in elementary and working with your own children who are younger, their ages, you can let us know in a moment. I think you may have mentioned it a little bit earlier, but you know, we're kind of all in the same sort of space here with our own children. However, you're coming from the secondary classroom. I'm wondering, do you mind sharing a little bit of what you're seeing going on in the secondary classroom as to why All of this matters and we will sort of take a ride down through the growth mindset train because we definitely want to share a wonderful resource that you've put together and talk to you about what's inspired you about that. So let's talk a little bit about the secondary classroom in your own classroom. What's raised your awareness to want to do some work and start changing the way things were? Because my guess is if you're like John and I, you probably had a time in your career where you were teaching pretty similar to how we were taught, which may or may not have been as focused around that growth mindset and around really making mathematics a little bit more of an active environment. Yes, definitely. So at the beginning of my teaching career, I would have been teaching in a much more traditional lecture style than what I am now. It still has a place in some cases. So I'm not saying that I don't ever do that because I still do, especially in some of the higher grade levels. But the change really has been in my junior classes, so grades 9 and 10. And I'm trying to put an emphasis now on collaboration and discussions in math, a lot of math talk in the classroom, because I know that like teachers like to talk a lot about what happens in the real world. Like that's always what teachers like to say, right? And I know that in major corporations, if you're working with any kind of math background, and when I say math, I can mean like engineering and computer science all in there. It's all in the same realm. There are endless group discussions at whiteboards, working out problems, problem solving every day. And so that's really what real life mathematics looks like in the business world. And so I'm trying to bring that more into my classrooms by using that thinking classroom approach. And so we're doing a lot of random groups, a lot of work up at the boards, and a lot of teaching through problem solving rather than lecturing and then practicing, right? Like the model used to be very much like I do, we do in partners, and then you do alone. But now we're changing that up where they're starting in groups, working on a problem immediately to see how we can work on it. And then topics come up and then there might be some direct instruction that happens in there because it's necessary many times, but it's all based on that problem solving model. For those of you listening, Alice is referring to some work done by Peter Lilladal, which we talked to on episode 19. And he talks about random grouping and the research behind whiteboards on the walls. If you have not listened to that episode, you want to jump over to that. Actually, I think Kyle Wright is our most listened to episode so far this year by a lot. So check that out. 
and rightfully so. Like that work in the math classroom changes the dynamic. It changes the culture. It just totally revamps the classroom into like a happier atmosphere, which is what we all want in math, right? We don't want to walk into a silent, independent working classroom. That's not a sign of good learning in my mind. And so I give a lot of praise to Peter and all of his work because I really believe in it and I do try to follow it quite extensively. Yes, for sure. And I just want to do a quick correction. I think it was episode number 21. So we'll put that in the show notes as well. And yeah, you're absolutely right, Alice. Like a big thing that I notice is if people, especially secondary, I find as secondary teachers and John and I and Alice, you're a secondary teacher as well. It is so challenging to kind of get away from what we've always seen and done, especially since it's so fresh in our minds, like elementary learning. It's not as fresh in my mind, like what it was like to be an elementary student. So I feel like mixing that up changes things a little bit. And in elementary, it tends to be more activity based anyway. There's this stigma that math class has to look a certain way, especially if we want it to be rigorous or if we want it to be effective. And Peter's method, even just by implementing the visible random grouping, as well as vertical non-permanent surfaces, as you mentioned, getting kids up at the whiteboards, like to me, that seems like such an easy start where like, I don't even have to change anything about my actual math program, not suggesting you never want to change it. But it's like, I don't have to go and do a ton of work, I can implement these changes in my class tomorrow, using whatever I had planned initially. And it's like that just gets the wheels moving. Did you feel like when you started implementing that vertical non permanent that it sort of like just got you going to see that like, oh, wait a second, maybe this could look differently. And then now I can start focusing on making other changes as I go instead of trying to make all these changes all at once. Yes, I think the vertical non-permanent services is definitely the catalyst to get started on the thinking classroom. It's probably the easiest in and the one that you're going to get the least pushback from. But ultimately, it's not an easy change if you're used to having the traditional classroom. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. And the students aren't going to find it very comfortable either. And so you can expect pushback in many ways. I always recommend that you start on day one instead of starting in the middle of a semester because then you set the stage and the culture in the classroom. It makes things far more easier in terms of that pushback if students understand that this is the norm in this classroom. I'm so glad that we had a chance here to talk a little bit about that because as you know, and I think our listeners know, we love that model uh, so much and Peter's work has been fabulous. I think we should turn our attention now to talk about your children's book, Everyone Can Learn Math. We've recently seen it's been added to a Reader's Choice Award, so congratulations on that for sure. Thank you. Yes, is in the children's category. Thank you. Right. Yeah. And uh, we love that you've written this book, not only to help children see that they can learn math with the right mindset, but I'm really enjoying that parents get that message too. I'm wondering if you can help our listeners a little bit to understand about the origin story of the book. Like, where did you get the inspiration to write this and a little bit about how it came to be? The hope is that it reaches parents, really. That's my primary audience. I have young children. So my children now are four and six and I have a lot of friends with young children. And I was at the time, so we're talking a year and a half ago, maybe when this all began, I was hearing more and more people with that negative attitude towards math. I'm hearing a lot of, I was never good at math, so I don't expect my kids to be good at math. Like a lot of really discouraging statements that I hate to hear. And so at one point, I wanted to find a book to recommend to some friends that they can read with their children to instill a bit more of a positive attitude towards math. And you both are parents, so you know what I mean? Like, we are big on books in my house. So there are books to help you with every stage in life as your children are growing up, right? So if your children are potty training, you get them the potty training book. Like when my daughter was waiting to become a big sister, we got her the you're going to be a big sister book to help her transition, right? Like these self-help children's books exist. And so I thought, surely there must be one to help you with your mindset in math. And so I searched and searched and I could not find anything. 
nothing related to math anyway. There are tons of growth mindset books in the market, but none specific to math. And so that was what I was really looking for. And that's where the idea came. So I started to look into how I might be able to do this and get this going on my own. I didn't think at the time it was going to be a lot of work. It turns out it's a lot of work and continues to be a lot of work. But that's where the initial idea came from. And the writing part wasn't really intimidating to me because I told you I do have a little bit of an English background. So the writing wasn't scary for me. It was the rest of the book making process that was more difficult. So I had a good story. I felt good about the story. I sent it to Dr. Joe Bowler. She read it. She gave me some feedback. So I felt really good about the story itself. The making of the book was really the hardship for me. But now it's here and I'm quite happy with it. It's got a lot of good reviews. A lot of parents are using it. So I think that it's doing well and it's been well received. I hope so anyway. You know, we've had Dr. Joe Bowler on the podcast. That was episode 10. We'll put a link in the show notes there. Obviously, her messaging is so important. I know it has had an influence on your thinking, and I know it's had an influence on John and I just to think a little bit differently about math. So that is huge. And that message comes out loud and clear throughout the book. You know, and I'm just thinking back to you referenced this idea of how with books and there's different stages of books as kids are growing up. And something that I got out of that, and you referenced like the potty training book, and it, there's like two things going on when we read to kids. Like there's this idea of we're teaching them stories, whether it's about morals or about the golden rule, or it's about how to do things in life, like you're saying, like potty training. And it's also doing this other thing where with books at an early age, it's like it starts with all pictures. It's just pictures like picture books. And then it goes to like pictures in one word. And then you get books that are like pictures in a few words. And then it's mostly words with one picture. And then eventually we get to a place where it's all words. And I feel like with math, we are missing both of those things in many cases, right? Like we're missing this case where you know, giving kids this opportunity to explore mathematics through just concrete experiences and pictures and then working their way to symbols, but then also just like the mindset piece and when is math important and why are we learning math and how should we be thinking about math as we're growing up? And it's so great that you've sort of filled this void in this particular niche here. And obviously we've got a ways to go because hopefully there'll be more books to come from whether it's yourself or other people. But I find that to be really interesting, at least an epiphany that I've just had on the fly. So for those who are listening and they're saying, okay, so there's this book she wrote, it's about growth mindset. Can you sort of give us a bit of a high level summary of the book for those who are listening? So if they are eager to dive in and maybe look this thing up online and get it off of Amazon, we'll be sure to include some show notes. Give them a bit of a summary. What's the book about and what messaging will their children as well as will the adults get by buying and reading this book? So the book is a children's book. So it's a picture book, not a primary reader, but maybe a little more advanced level. It's a story about a young girl named Amy and Amy is struggling with a math assignment. So she has a problem that she's working on. The problem is outlined in the book and she's really struggling to get this problem and she's giving up and getting angry and her mother is trying to help her, though her mother admits that she also struggled with math, but she's trying really to be positive for Amy to help her work through this. So she gives up, thinks she's not a math person, and then she goes on about her day and starts to make some connections internally about other things in her life that require hard work and practice and how that's how we get better and improve ourselves. So by the end, Amy realizes that she should apply that same ethic to learning math. She needs to practice more and have a better attitude about it. And of course, she gets some encouragement from her teacher, her friends. And by the end, she is able to work through the problem using a different strategy than what she was trying at the beginning of the book. So the message for children there is that perseverance, the connection of learning math to learning other things like sports, and that we don't just say, I'm not a runner. I don't, I'm not going to learn how to run, right? Running is something everybody can do, maybe not at an Olympic level, but we can all progress and get better at it with dedicated practice and longer distances as we go. And so that's the same thing with learning math. Whereas I think people are kind of used to pushing math aside as something that you either know or you don't know. 
rather than working hard at it to get better or to improve. And I think the message has been clear to parents also, and it helps parents realize that negative math talk in the house is really detrimental to their children's math ability, their future math ability, and contributes to the math anxiety that our young children have right when they start school. Right. Such powerful motivators there too. And and I think your book is doing a great job of helping those parents understand that message. Definitely, I want to dive into that message a little bit later too, but I know there's a story behind how you chose an illustrator for the book too. Do you mind sharing who the illustrator is or how you chose that illustrator? So I wasn't really sure how to go about finding an illustrator because the book is self-published through a company. There are lots of different ways to publish books nowadays, thanks to the internet. And so it's not fully self-published. It was done through a company. So I could pay them to do illustrations or I could find my own illustrator. And so I preferred to find my own. I found it a little more personable. And so I had a former student from my high school do the illustrations and I commissioned her to do the work. I told her how I envisioned each page and she was able to articulate that in the way that I asked her to. She did a great job. She's now studying art at the art school in Nova Scotia. So it was a former student from my school. I had coached her basketball long ago when she was in grade nine. That was many, many years ago now. Yeah, it's so great when you can actually take students and obviously speaking about growth mindset and really all students have different skills that they've been honing in on. And it's not because they were born with them, but because it's something they enjoy and they put that purposeful practice in. And what a great way to sort of like mesh those two things together. So, you know, focusing on the growth mindset around math, but then also going and grabbing a student who a former student, a former player from one of your teams and being able to leverage their creativity, which I think is super exciting. Now, I'm wondering, I've just read the book, let's say I'm just putting it down down. Do you have any recommendations or tips on how teachers, if I'm a teacher who's just grabbed this book for my own children, how might I take the messaging in this book and extend the lessons from the story into their classroom? Do you have any like maybe starter tips or things like, let's say I'm a teacher going like, wow, I haven't heard this idea or maybe I've heard of this idea of growth mindset, but I just don't feel like I'm doing it right now. Is there anything like might be kind of a low hanging fruit to get them started? The first thing I would recommend is starting with the language that the teacher uses and the language students are using. So maybe students could find a sentence that they say to themselves all the time, like, I'm really bad at multiplying. And then how can you take that sentence and tweak the wording in it? Because I'm a big believer in vocabulary and and the power of words. Tweak that vocabulary into more of a growth mindset message. And so the popular idea right now is to always use the word yet, but that we don't need to stop there. So the example I said was, I'm not good at multiplying or I'm bad at multiplying, right? And you could say, I'm not good at multiplying yet, but that's kind of basic, right? Can we change it so that we're, I have not yet learned to multiply, but I've been practicing with arrays. So that would be a tweak off the top of my head. So something like that with the vocabulary used in the classroom, I think is a great starter. I have heard of a lot of children and students using the book as a takeoff for activities. I had one class in Australia write letters about how the book changed their mindset. And so that was really powerful. And then I had another group at a math camp who decided they really wanted to write books about math. So they worked on stories that involved math problems. And I thought that was really fun because that combines my two love of books and math together. And I thought that was quite creative. And I enjoyed watching them build their stories surrounded by manipulatives. They had flyers and they had fake money and counters and stuff, and they were building their problems. I love your suggestion. You know, you had mentioned the word yet, and that seems to be sort of the popular idea around growth mindset and something that's really interesting. And I've read an article, I'll see if I can link it up for the show notes. I can't remember where it was from, but it was just talking about this idea of like a false growth mindset, right? Like if we just use the message, and that's kind of what I got from your statement there was like, if we just add yet onto something, 
things probably aren't going to change because you haven't really articulated, like, how are you going about it? So for example, if I don't feel like I'm very good at multiplying yet, but I'm actually not even considering what I need to do in order to get better, like I haven't actually thought about whether I'm going to actually work on that skill, then it's probably eventually going to turn into a more of a fixed mindset thought because it's not going to change, right? Like for a growth mindset mentality or mindset to stick, you have to see some results over time. And if we just leave it at changing our language and we don't actually think beyond that, I can see how some people might maybe fall off the, I hate to call it a bandwagon, but in that case, it would be, right? If you just change you know, it to yet and you haven't actually done anything about it, then you're not actually going to think that a growth mindset actually is helpful. So I really like how you've articulated that. I think that's pretty key. It comes down to goal setting, right? When we set a goal, there are goals and then there are smart goals. I'm sure everyone's heard that term before. And you really need to set attainable, realistic goals with a plan in mind. And so the same thing goes if you just say, I can't do this yet without some kind of foresight of how you're going to get better at it. It's not going to happen. I'm wondering, since you are a high school math teacher like we are, and this book was primarily written for parents, and then we've just mentioned, and I think a lot of schools are using your book in their classrooms on elementary. As a high school teacher, how have you used your book or the messaging in your book to influence high schoolers? Or maybe there's another book on the way for high schoolers. I don't know if there's another book on the way. I am being asked that a lot, and I and I don't know right now. High schoolers, I will say very openly that I have not used the book in my classroom, and I probably will not because I don't want to involve any kind of conflict of interest there. But the ideas of the growth mindset in math, I use daily. That's what I breathe and preach on a daily basis in my classroom. And that's why I wrote the book. Otherwise, if I didn't believe in it, I wouldn't have written it. So the ideas of the growth mindset are, I hope, very visible in my classroom on a daily basis in terms of embracing when we're struggling, uh, coming up with strategies to get through that struggle. I demonstrate it by when I make a mistake, I can fully admit that and then we work on how I can fix that. When we do assessments, I allow reassessments afterwards. I just, I'm really a believer in if you're going to preach the growth mindset, you have to do it fully and you have to demonstrate it in all aspects. So I hope that's visible in my classroom. I think that it is. I hope my students would say the same thing, but I do try to embrace that culture. Yeah. For sure. And you know what, I can speak to this. I don't always have the pleasure of speaking from personal experience when we invite people onto the show, but I have had the opportunity to go into your classroom and at your school, your department, yourself and Chez, your fellow uh, colleague and department head are doing such great things. And we had a discussion about this the last time we had done a walkthrough with our math task force at Walkerville. And, you know, something that I brought up at the table was just this idea that you are really owning the belief area. And for those who have read Principles to Actions, if they haven't, definitely pick up that book from NCTM. It's such a useful book on unpacking like how to be an effective math teacher and to provide an excellent learning experience for students. And at the beginning of the book, they start with beliefs and you know, productive versus unproductive beliefs. And it is clear that you and your department are working so hard in this area. And when I walked through your class, I've had the opportunity to go into your class a couple of times. And when I go in there, you see students who are engaged fully in the mathematical process. There's lots of math discourse. So I can definitely attest to the fact that I see it happening and I'm sure your students see it and feel it as well. So we're looking at the time here. We don't want to keep you all day. This is your summer break. But with summer coming to an end for some of our U.S. friends very soon and for us in Ontario, we'll be starting up shortly as well. And actually, when this episode goes live, I think we will be back at school. I'm wondering, what is your first day of school look like in order to really try to hone in on the belief message and the growth mindset messaging like what does that look like or sound like or you can even you know expand out to the week but just to get that culture going in your classroom like what are some of the things that are on your mind when you come into class 
that's a good question. The first day of class has changed for me in the last couple of years because we were told that we should be outlining the classroom expectations, the rules. We should be going over the course information sheet and that sort of thing. And that's what I used to do, but I don't anymore. So now I take the first day it's very important for me to set the culture in the classroom on that first day. And then all of the classroom management stuff can wait until later in the week. So on that first day, we set the group norms. So I'm doing an activity based on Joe Bowler's U-Cubed Week of Inspirational Math. And I don't remember which week it is, but you can look through it. There are lots of different weeks the first activity is what good group work looks like and what it does not look like. And we sort of develop these norms as a class together of what we want to see in our groups and what we don't want to see. And we leave them up for a while so that they're there. And then I can make reference to them as we start working in groups. And then we go into the week of inspirational math problems. And I think the first one I have done more typically is the four fours because it's open-ended and has a very low entry point. So it's not intimidating for students, but it's still involving math. So for a grade nine or 10, most students can start doing something in that problem right away. And so we're put into random groups right from the start. We go up to the boards, the vertical non-permanent services. I pose this problem to them and then they start working on it. That will take most of my first period up by then. And so that I tell them, this is what our math class is going to look like. We're going to be working in groups. We're going to change those groups up constantly so that you don't get used to working with the same people. We are going to work on the boards so that everybody can see your work and I can see your work and we can all talk about it and ask questions about it very easily rather than when it's in your notebook at your desk. And that sets the stage, really. If you do that on the first day, and then you do it again on the second day and the third day, you do it for that first week, those students are going to expect that that's what we do in this classroom. And that in itself is a type of normalcy and comfort for them when they get used to the look of the classroom, and that's what it's going to look like. Right. One, wonderful. And I think what it also does is it also shows them what you're valuing in class, which is not always just about answer getting. And it's not always just about, you know, it's about growth. And yeah, I think when you have it up like that, you start on day one and you keep going with that consistently, it tells the kids exactly what you expect and that you're valuing that growth, which is the big message there. So thank you for sharing that. Just before we wrap up here for this episode, we want to point our listeners to one more resource you have, which is your YouTube channel, Mrs. A Loves Math. We did a quick look at it before. I've used it in my class too as a high school teacher. And right now, Mrs. A Loves Math's YouTube channel is all about skills. And uh, right now, I think you got like 1.3 thousand subscribers. And, you know, some of your videos have over 34,000 views. Like, it's something. There are a lot of people using that resource. How do you see people using that resource in their classrooms? And then we'll wrap up. Thank you for visiting the YouTube channel. I think that's it's flattering that you use it. It was never created with the intention to be used in the classroom, and I rarely, if ever, use it in my classroom. It was intended as an after-hours go to when students need help, especially for my senior students, because I do teach the grade 12 advanced functions a lot. And I find that they do have to do a little more practice at home and the, and the course is more intensive. And so they find themselves at home. And when they're stuck, they were going to things like Khan Academy, which is wonderful, but uses different vocabulary and sometimes goes off on a tangent that is not really relevant to what they're working on. And so it started as just something for them to reference that use the vocab that we use in class and the methods that we learned in class, the very simple, basic algorithms to get through problems. And so not very much how I run my classroom at all, but something that they can use when they're in need of help. And it's sort of now, I guess, escalated into something quite large. It looks like it has a decent following, but the intention was not that people use it in the classroom because it's a bit more of a, like it's direct instruction, which has a place, but like I wouldn't play them in class. 
I'm so happy that you've articulated that because I think it's really easy for us educators to not really like to see resources and be like, wow, this is a good resource and then maybe use it here or there and maybe not in quite the best place. And I'm definitely a firm believer in that as well. Like I'm not eagerly searching for videos to bring into my classroom. I mean, I use three act math task videos to like spark engagement and those types of things. But for this sort of like, we'll call it tutorial type video, That's more for like when we're at that purposeful practice phase and a student gets stuck or they just aren't understanding how to go about solving a certain type of problem and they want to check out some other methods, especially if I'm in a class where maybe the teacher isn't really advocating for the use of multiple strategies or like concrete or visual strategies, that could be really helpful as well. So thanks for articulating that. if, If a student is at home and they're stuck on something, and they're not making any progress, that's not useful to them, right? That's not a productive use of their time. So it's just meant as a means to get them on to the next step so that they can move on and make some progress. Because that's not going to happen if they're just not doing anything. Again, I think that's great to clarify. Awesome. So we'll definitely put that in the show notes. Before we wrap up here, where can Math Moment Makers find more from Alice Aspinall? And we will include them all in the show notes. Go ahead. Where can we find more? Um, well, you can follow me on Twitter at Alice Espinal, and that account is used more for what I'm doing in my classroom for math learning. And then I also have Twitter for my book, which is at Everyone Can Math, and my book resources. So I share a lot of ideas for talking about math with young children and how to bring that math conversation in everyday life things. So you can find those on Instagram at everyone can learn math. And I have a Facebook group also, not a group, sorry, a page at everyone can learn math. And then I do have some resources about some positive math vocabulary on my website, everyone can learn math.com. We will put all of those in the show notes for sure. And I'm sure people will be diving into those and following those and getting into that Facebook page great resources for us to keep this discussion going and also to uh, help our kids understand that everyone can learn math. So uh, Alice, we want to thank you for joining us here on the podcast and we hope you enjoy the rest of your summer or at the time of this recording where, you know, it's scary to say this, right, Kyle, that it's almost half done. And uh, I know, I know I was thinking about that today. Today's the start of the the fourth week of our summer. So it's scary, but I hope you enjoy the rest of this summer and we will will be back to school before you know it. So uh, thank you again, Alice, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. We want to thank Alice again for spending some time with us to share her powerful messages about mathematics teaching, growth mindset, and math beliefs in the home. As always, how will you reflect on what you've heard from this episode? Have you written ideas down, drawn a sketch note, sent out a tweet, called a colleague? Be sure to engage in some form of reflection to ensure that the learning sticks. Also, the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast is excited to bring you another giveaway. This time it's with Whitebook, our source for white book flip charts. That's right. You can easily post whiteboards anywhere in your room, and you can easily bring them with you wherever you go. Whitebook is offering you, the Math Moment Maker community, the chance to win one of five flip chart packs. Yes, I said it. One of five flip chart packs by visiting makemathmoments.com forward slash giveaway. Not interested in chancing it? You can also take advantage of a special 50% discount on flip chart packs by simply entering the giveaway. Simply enter the giveaway by visiting makemathmoments.com forward slash giveaway, and you'll also see how you can take advantage of that discount. Don't delay. The giveaway and 50% discount ends on Wednesday, August 28th, 2019. Head over to makemathmoments.com forward slash giveaway to get your name in the hat. Listening after Wednesday, August 28th, 2019, no sweat. We are always actively running giveaways. So check out makemathmoments.com forward slash giveaway to learn what draw we have running now. Remember, you got to play to win. Dive in at makemathmoments.com forward slash giveaway. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash giveaway. In order to ensure you don't miss out on any episodes as they come out each week, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or on your favorite podcast platform. 
Also, if you're liking what you're hearing, please share the podcast with a colleague and help us reach a wider audience by leaving us a review on iTunes and tweet us your biggest takeaway by tagging at Make Math Moments on Twitter. Show notes and links for this episode can be found at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 39. Again, that's makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 39. Well, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And high fives for 